Where the heck is Dr. Fauci? Did you notice that since about a week before the State of the Union address, all of a sudden, this man who has been a media whore, excuse my French, just disappeared from the airwaves. Turn on CNN. Nope, he's not there. Turn on MSNBC. Nope, not there either. No, he just vanished. Just vanished. So the reason why, I mean, obviously, the obvious question is, why did he vanish? Well, the reason he vanished is because he's very unpopular among the American people. Nobody trusts him anymore, even on the left. Um, Biden wants to end COVID-19 without any science changing. And when I when I say without any science changing, we never should have had these lockdowns and these provisions, these mandates to begin with. And so Biden's finally ending them because it's politically expedient, not because any science has changed. How is Fauci going to answer that when he is a zero COVID uh, crier? He doesn't want to end any of these any of these interventions until COVID is gone. And then of course, the Republicans, God willing, and if they don't mess this up, are going to take back the House and the Senate in just a couple months, in November of 2022. And of course, they're going to investigate Dr. Fauci. So where the heck is Dr. Fauci? He's disappearing. He's pulling the great disappearing act because it is politically expedient for the left. But I think that there is a larger issue at play here, a larger scandal that Fauci and perhaps the Biden administration as well know that they won't be able to avoid regardless of whether the Republicans take back just the House or whether they take back the Senate. And what I mean by this, I'm going to fully explain what I mean here. Yesterday, Senator Marco Rubio was asking Victoria Nuland from the Department of State, Biden's Department of State, about Ukraine and about these reports on Russian media. Now, this was propaganda from the Russians. Reports on Russian media that Ukraine was going to stage a bioweapon attack and they were going to act like it was a false flag attack. So the allegation on Russian media, the propaganda, accused the Ukrainians of possibly waging a bioweapons attack, blaming it on the Russians as a, as an excuse or as justification for, um, well, drawing NATO and the U.S., drawing the world into this war. Rubio was asking Biden's Department of State about this and take a listen to this conversation. It's, it's extremely interesting. Well, um, I only have a minute left. Let me ask you, um, does Ukraine have chemical or biological weapons? Uh Ukraine has uh, biological research facilities, which, in fact, we are now quite concerned Russian troops, Russian forces may be seeking to uh, gain control of. So we are working with the Ukrainians on how they can prevent any of those research materials from falling into the hands of uh, Russian forces should they approach. I I'm sure you're aware that the Russian propaganda groups are already putting out there all kinds of information about how they've uncovered a plot by the Ukrainians to release biological weapons in the country and with NATO's coordination. If there's a biological or chemical weapon incident or, uh, or attack inside of Ukraine, is there any doubt in your mind that 100 percent it would be the Russians that would be behind it? There is no doubt in my mind, Senator, and it is classic Russian uh, technique to blame on the other guy what they're planning to do themselves. So first of all, to begin with, anything that you hear on Russian media is obviously propaganda, and it's obviously propaganda with a purpose. Um, I think, however, that a lot of Republicans are missing the point about this Rubio clip. It's obviously gone wildly viral, as it should, because Victoria Nuland didn't just say, no, there aren't bioweapons labs in Ukraine. She danced around it. She, she in a sense, acknowledge that they exist. She just tried to paint them as being part of the biodefense efforts of the United States and our partners abroad, which is basically a nuanced way of saying, yes, there are bioweapons labs in Ukraine that the U.S. is involved in. This might remind you of Wuhan, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, because that's exactly the same talking points, the same narrative that the left spun around the Wuhan Institute of Virology, that it wasn't bio weapons research. It was just biodefense. They wanted to have, they wanted to understand and anticipate what pathogen might be unleashed on the world. And so they had to juice up the viruses themselves to see which pathogen might naturally evolve and jump from animal to human. I mean, it was just a load of BS. They also, they also use vaccine development as one of their euphemistic talking points. They say, well, in order to develop a vaccine for one of these, we have to understand how the, for one of these viruses, we have to understand how the virus works, which I guess requires them to turn the virus into a bioweapon. Funny how that works. So the, the most interesting, illustrative part of Victoria Nuland's answer, she didn't just say no. She essentially admitted that bioweapons research happens. She just justified it 
as well. It's part of bio defense. We're trying to protect the world. Yeah, that's what Dr. Fauci has always said. That's what the Wuhan Institute of Virology said. That's what that's what Peter Daszak at Eco Health Alliance. That's what all of these people said that this is bio uh, bio defense, not bio weapons. Well, it turns out. It's essentially potato, potato. And so I think Republicans are somewhat missing the point here. There can be two things that are true at once. And the first thing that can be true is when Russia accuses the Ukraine of potentially waging a bioweapons attack, that's propaganda, right? It's, it's propaganda. The Russians always do exactly what Victoria Nuland said. They accuse their opposition of doing what they intend to do. So if there is a bioweapons attack in Ukraine, of course it came from the Russians. It's not the Ukrainians. It's not a false flag attack from Zelensky and his people. It is the Russians if they do that. And maybe the Russians are trying to lay the groundwork so that they can wage a biological or chemical weapons attack in in Ukraine. So that can be true in and of itself, that the Russian propaganda is propaganda, and that if there is a bioweapons attack in Ukraine, it's obviously from the Russians. That's true. But it's also a separate issue of whether there is bioweapons research happening at laboratories in Ukraine tied somehow, perhaps financially, to the U.S. government. There's no, after Wuhan, why wouldn't we believe that this is true? Why wouldn't we at least ask these questions? Why wouldn't we be skeptical of the narrative coming from the Biden administration? Why wouldn't we, why wouldn't we doubt what we are being told? Why wouldn't we investigate this? In fact, this, this absolutely should be investigated. The U.S. Embassy in Ukraine in 2020 issued this statement. I want to bring this statement up because I want to read it word for word. This was from April 22nd of 2020. This is what they write. They say the U.S. Embassy would like to set the record straight, lol, regarding disinformation spreading in some circles in Ukraine that mirrors Russian disinformation regarding the strong U.S.-Ukrainian partnership to reduce biological threats. Here in Ukraine, the U.S. Department of Defense's biological threat reduction program works with the Ukrainian government. Now, understand what that sentence, before the sentence is even completed, the premise of this sentence admits that there is a partnership between Ukraine and the Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense, regarding pathogens, regarding viruses, regarding bioweapons. Now, they go on to say, here in Ukraine, the U.S. Department of Defense's biological threat reduction program works with the Ukrainian government to consolidate and secure pathogens and toxins of security concern in Ukrainian government facilities while allowing for peaceful research and vaccine development. Like, have you ever heard of a more euphemistic sentence than it, than this? What does this even mean? To consolidate and secure pathogens and toxins of security concern in Ukraine. So they're making a bank of pathogens and toxins under the guise of it being for defense, although that's the exact same thing that they would do if it were bioweapons research. They just, it's now under a different name. And they say, um, while allowing for peaceful research, well, what is peaceful research? Is peaceful research the same as what happened in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, is gain of function. If, if you present the gain of function research, juicing up the viruses to make them more transmissible among humans, to make them more fatal for humans, if it's done under the guise of, oh, we're not going to release this as a bioweapon, does that count as biodefense? Because that's what happened in Wuhan. So this sentence is the most euphemistic sentence, which again, this was two years ago. Two years ago, this came from the US Embassy in, in Ukraine which tells you that, sure, Russia's always going to wage a propaganda war. They're always going to lie. They're always going to play this game where they accuse others of doing what they plan to do. But that doesn't make this other part false. It doesn't make it untrue that the U.S. Department of Defense is somehow funding bioweapons, quote unquote, defense, which means bioweapons research in these labs in Ukraine. In Ukraine, this is, they go on to say, we also work, with our Ukrainian partners to ensure Ukraine can detect and report outbreaks caused by dangerous pathogens before they pose security or stability threats. Now, these words, some of these words seem innocuous and they are not innocuous before they pose security or stability threats. Anything that's anticipatory means that they are creating problems that they think could be the problem that they will face or they are creating bioweapons in an effort to, well, they tell us in an effort to create also the solution to the problem. But if you create the bioweapons in order to create the solution to the problem, then Houston, we have a different kind of problem. The point of all of this, 
The point of all of this is back in 2020, the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine admitted that they had partnered with the Ukrainian government, the Department of Defense actually partnered with the Ukrainian government on laboratories that house pathogens and viruses and toxins that can be used as bioweapons. And we also know that the U.S. government very euphemistically pretends that they don't do or fund bioweapons research because that's in violation of international norms and international law now. But we know that they actually do bioweapons research under the guise of biodefense. It's a sleight of hand. It's a lie, which is why well, which is why when Newsweek, I was reading about this earlier and I read a Newsweek article to see the other side, the other side of this picture. And this sentence absolutely slayed me because Newsweek writes, in fact, the U.S. Department of Defense has never had a biological laboratory in Ukraine. And I thought, OK, this is also what the media does when the media runs coverage for the U.S. government, when the media runs coverage for the Democrats, they always make these statements that are larger than what's true. There was never an allegation that the U.S. Department of Defense in and of itself had a biological laboratory in Ukraine. No one was making that allegation. The allegation or what ought to be investigated because there seems to be signs that point in that direction. And if it is the case, would be very troubling. What seems that it might be the case is that the U.S. Department of Defense is taking our money, yours and mine, our tax money, and partnering with a Ukrainian lab to mess around with bioweapons, to mess around with viruses and pathogens and toxins. So when Newsweek says, in fact, the U.S. Department of Defense or Department, yeah, Defense Department has never had a biological laboratory in Ukraine, no one ever said that they did. Newsweek and other mainstream outlets are just pretending you are stupid. So this brings us back to Dr. Fauci. I said at the beginning of the show, where is Dr. Fauci? Why has he disappeared? Part of it is politically expedient for Biden just to get him out of the way because Fauci wants zero COVID. He doesn't want any of these interventions to stop, none of the mandates to stop until there is no COVID, which looks like it will never happen. It looks like COVID is now endemic, which means it's just something we're going to have to live with. Fauci does not accept this because he is an absolute nutcase. But the other reason Fauci is hiding is he's the one who should be questioned about the U.S. Department of Defense's partnership with the Ukrainian laboratories because Fauci under uh, the NIH, especially the NIAID, which is the sub-agency that Fauci is in charge of, deals with literally billions of dollars in grants when, as it pertains to biodefense. Fauci is the one who holds the purse strings for a lot of these programs. And if he doesn't technically hold the purse strings, he holds the influence because the people who do hold the purse strings need Fauci to approve grants that he holds at the NIAID. So where is Fauci? Fauci is missing. Fauci is missing right at the time where we find other laboratories or there's, there's confirmation from the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine two years ago that the U.S. Department of Defense did in fact partner with Ukraine on biological laboratories. There's just a euphemistic uh, reason given for why this is okay and shouldn't threaten the, the American people. Again, I cannot stress enough that if there's a biological weapons attack in Ukraine, it's obviously the Russians. It's not a false flag from the Ukrainians. It's obviously the Russians. The Russians are running propaganda. But what we are being told about these potential laboratories from the U.S. government, not from Russian propaganda sources, from the U.S. government is that they exist. And if they exist and Fauci has given them money, then we should know about it. It should be investigated. My friends, always be skeptical of the narrative that we are told. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. New inflation numbers are out, and I agree with American Hartford Gold. They are the worst this country has seen in 40 years. This is just fact. The price of gas is up. The price of housing also up. The U.S. national debt is way up. And with our current administration printing and spending trillions of dollars, experts don't see it getting better anytime soon. So how do you protect your money, your retirement, your savings? Well, when times are turbulent, Americans like you turn to real assets like physical gold and silver. American Hartford Gold can show you how to hedge your hard-earned savings against inflation by helping you diversify a portion of your portfolio into physical gold and silver. All it takes to get started is a short phone call, and they'll have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or inside your IRA or 401k, and they make it easy. If you call them right now, they will give you up to $1,500 of free silver on your first order. So don't wait. Call them now. Call 855-768-1883. 
That's 855-768-1883 or text Liz to 65532. Again, that's 855-768-1883 or text Liz, L-I-Z, to 65532. Do you know what I would like if our public health establishment said? Do you know what I would like to see from, I guess it's too much to ask from Dr. Fauci because he's such a committed ideologue. He's so corrupt. He's so financially tied to big pharma. And he's done this. He's run this cartel from the government colluding with big pharma for decades. So maybe it's too much to ask to think that Fauci would have a come to Jesus moment like this. But do you know what I would like and what I think a lot of us would like to see? If doctors and public health officials and politicians who at the beginning of the pandemic, and I'm talking the very beginning, I'm talking March 2020, were very scared of COVID-19. They oh, they overblew the risk of it. They told us it was going to be much worse than it is. They told us many more people were going to die than have. They presented lockdowns and masks and vaccine mandates as if they were the necessary, proper, and only thing that we could do to save our country. I would love if some of these doctors just admitted that they were wrong. If they actually just came out and said, you know what? I made a mistake. I was wrong. I've now seen the data and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I did that. I've learned my lesson. I would love if someone had a little humility. It's, it's actually shocking and discouraging to see how many doctors and public health officials and politicians don't do this. But there is one doctor that I want to highlight today who changed his mind. He called for lockdowns at the beginning of the pandemic and he is now saying that looking at the data, he was wrong. And he actually, li listen to what he says, actually. I, I want him to speak for himself. Listen to what he says to the great, the doctors on the Great Barrington Declaration. Take a look. When you have the front row, you don't necessarily, can, you can't necessarily see the whole picture. You know, for example, in the first wave, my nurses and I, we were, we saw so many people dying from COVID. It was, it, it horrified us. It was more death than any of us had ever seen. Freezer trucks at our at our door, holding the bodies that for the leftover, you know, from that our morgue could handle. At that time, the only thing I could see was we needed more aggressive COVID policies to get this plague under control, stop these deaths from happening. I was confident that all of the locations that didn't embrace this like aggressive COVID policy, they were going to suffer tremendous deaths and. What we would see next is then, of course, what would follow is they would see how much death they suffered and it would become so painfully obvious that they would adopt all the aggressive policies. But I was wrong. I, I was, my views were wrong at that time because the states and nations that didn't take aggressive COVID policies, they didn't do obviously worse. You know, it was, took me about a year into the pandemic before it became really clear that it wasn't obvious at all that any policy was strongly effective at reducing COVID infections or, or death outside of within the, uh, the island nations where clearly border control looked like it did have a pretty strong effect. So the scientist in me had to take this emerging data that I was seeing and acknowledge my hypothesis had been, had been falsified, I guess you can say. And the COVID policies that I was so certain were necessary, they just didn't help the way that I would hope they have had helped. And then I realized something that I kind of ignored that, you know, much of the people here have discussed and brought up, which is that these policies were harmful. Is that the most refreshing thing that you've seen all week? I saw this, I, I very rarely watch political videos and um, feel my heart warming, but this one I watched and I thought, wow, the humility that it took to say that and the open-mindedness that it took to let the data lead you versus fear, emotion, or ideology, I have so much respect for that. So thank you, sir, for saying this. Thank you for changing your mind. You are an example that should be followed the country over. Contrast this, my friends, with Jen Psaki. I know, I hate to show you such a heartwarming video and then force you to watch Jen Psaki, but this is what we're dealing with on the other side of the aisle. So Florida, obviously, and by the way, the video that I just showed was from the consortium in Florida. It was Ron DeSantis' roundtable event. And following Ron DeSantis' roundtable event, the Surgeon General in Florida said that they're no longer going to advise that healthy children get the COVID-19 vaccine for obvious reasons, that the risks outweigh the benefits, just according to the science. Um, Saki was asked about this, and this is what she responded. Take a listen. And then last, the Florida Surgeon General says that healthy children shouldn't get the COVID vaccine. 
Is that a good policy? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, let me just note that we know the science. Uh, we know the data uh, and what works um, and what is the most what the most effective steps are in protecting people of a range of ages from uh, hospitalization and even death. The FDA and CDC have already weighed in and the safety uh, on the safety and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines for those five and older. The recommendations are vetted transparently through a process for, uh, with a purpose so that parents can have confidence after consulting with their pediatricians or doctors if they would like about the safety. But we also know through the data that unvaccinated teenagers are three times as likely to, the, to be hospitalized if they get COVID mm -hmm. than vaccinated teenagers. So it's deeply disturbing that there are politicians peddling conspiracy theories out there and casting doubt on vaccinations when it is our best tool against the virus and the best tool to prevent even teenagers from being hospitalized. Go ahead. And you know what just kills me about this answer? It's not even her condescension, which is perpetually annoying. But the FDA said we have a video we have seen videotape of the FDA actually admitting that they don't know whether the vaccine is going to be safe and effective for children, that they're going to have to try it out on children, experiment on our kids before they find out. We saw that video for ourselves, heard, heard these public health officials say this to each other, and then they voted to approve it for children. And so the audacity of Saki, first of all, to use the word transparency, to use the word transparency, to call somebody else a conspiracy theorist. The, the Surgeon General of Florida, by the way, is a Harvard-educated doctor. I'm not about the technocracy, so I'm not going to harp on this point that Saki is a press secretary and he is a doctor because I think everyone is entitled to have their own opinion and everyone, regardless of their educational background, can be informed and even have expertise on an issue. Um, it is ironic, however, that Saki, Saki is claiming that a Harvard-educated doctor is a conspiracy theorist just because he... Is quite, or he's following the science. He's not even questioning her ideology. He's just following the science. Meanwhile, she doesn't mention the infection fatality rate of COVID for children, the hospitalization rate, the side effect profile of the vaccine itself. And so I watched this and I thought, oh my goodness, parents of America, do not cower. I know that there are public schools and pediatricians who are pushing, some of them are mandating, both pediatricians and schools are mandating the COVID-19 vaccine for children five years old and over. Do not cower to this bullying. Listen to your intuition. If you feel that this is too great of a risk for your child, don't let someone else convince you that it's not. Push back and then wait. When enough parents, enough people push back um, on the ideology that underpins Saki's position and forces our country, whether it's public schools, whether it's government institutions, whether it's, you know, pediatrics, to actually follow the science and not the ideology or the big pharma profit motive, then when enough people push back, this, this should change. On that note, even when people like Fauci hide, even when the mainstream media suddenly, after the State of the Union just like a snap, stops talking about COVID-19 and becomes obsessed with Ukraine, there are other apparatuses that the left has built to try to control this narrative on COVID-19. And so as not to be vague here, I'm talking about big tech. So Facebook this week, um, slapped me with a one of their fact checks, their fake fact checks. And it will come as no surprise to you. I'm sure you can anticipate what I'm going to say here. It was on the video that I did or the part of the show from last week when I read the document from Pfizer, the document that they intended, the side effect profile, that they intended to hide from se for 75 years until we're all dead. And the government, well, through a Freedom of Information Act request, actually, they were forced to release this document. In this document is eight to nine pages of um, side effects that were observed after the vaccine had rolled out, meaning, and these were observed through last February. So basically, Pfizer and the federal government knew about these side effects from the vaccine um, over a year ago and wanted to hide them from the American people. And so what I did is I read, I read the document. I read how they wanted it to be confidential, how they didn't want it disseminated. I read just the names of the different side effects that could happen. And this seems fairly innocuous to me. I said at the time, there's no reason big tech should censor me. And I said it with a laugh because I knew they would. But there's no reason big tech should censor me because I'm not even stating an opinion here. I'm not giving any medical recommendations. I'm not, I'm not saying anything about 
the vaccine itself or whether people should take it. I mean, everyone knows what my opinion on this is. But for the purposes of this game that I play with big tech, sometimes I do segments or bits or read documents or show videos where I don't say the obvious conclusion because we're all smart. We don't need the obvious conclusion stated for us anyway. I just show the video or read the document and let let us all draw the conclusions ourselves. And Big Tech still censors it. They still censor it. They did. They slapped a fake fact check. This is it. You can see it on the screen. This is what they sent to my Facebook page. It says false information in a post shared by your page. Independent fact checkers at Lead Stories say information in a post shared by Liz Wheeler is false. To stop the spread of false news, we've added a notice to the post. This is the notice they added to the post. Fact check. Pfizer document does not list thousands of side effects from COVID vaccines. It's required list of potential side effects. Um, Hilarious. Okay, a couple of things here. (laughs) A couple of things here. Let's start with this, this first line, independent fact. Actually, no, let's start with the actual first line, false information. What, what's false in what I said? Literally, what is false? Is this document a, a, a valid document? Has this been verified that, that this document is from Pfizer? Is this a real document or is it a forgery? There, this Facebook and this fact checker are not making any allegation that the document that I read was inauthentic. This is an authentic document from Pfizer that the U.S. federal government forced Pfizer to release. So what's what's the false information? If I read anything that was false, then the allegation should be that Pfizer is disseminating fake information. But nothing I said was false. That's the first thing. The second thing is they say independent fact checkers at lead stories. Bam, let's stop right there. Independent fact checkers. Lead stories is the name of the fact checker. So who is lead stories? Well, lead stories is an organization that lists who gives them money to conduct these fact checks. They are an official partner of Facebook, which means that Facebook gives them money that does not make you independent, that actually renders you dependent on Facebook. If you are receiving money from Facebook, you are not independent. Lead stories also takes money from Google. Lead stories also takes money from ByteDance. Look at this on the screen. This is the financial information about our fact-checking operation. That's what that's what Lead Stories titles their page. In 2020, these were the people that they got money from. Facebook, LLC, Google, LLC, ByteDance, LLC. So let's stop there for a second. ByteDance, who is ByteDance? ByteDance is the owner of TikTok. TikTok is an app that is tied to the Chinese Communist Party. You can't even say the word Tiananmen Square on TikTok or you will be kicked off the platform. ByteDance has a direct partnership with the Chinese Ministry of Public Security. That is an entity of the Chinese Communist Party. In fact, it's the same entity that persecutes Christians in China. ByteDance has a direct partnership with them. They also have a partnership with the Chinese state-run media apparatus in Beijing called Taotio. This is an apparatus of the Chinese Communist Party and Lead Stories takes money directly from ByteDance. So independent, are you an independent fact checker, Lead Stories? Yeah, no, 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 I think not. I think not. So this is the post, by the way, Instagram did the same thing. So Meta now owns Facebook and Instagram. Instagram actually put a cover, they put a slide over the video that I posted on Instagram. It's apparently just too dangerous for anybody to see. It says false information. The same information was reviewed by an independent fact checker in another post, see why. So if you click this button, see why, which of course I did, right? That's what takes you to the lead stories, the lead stories um, page. This is what they say. This is the story. It's written by, on March 3rd, by a man named Ed Payne. And let's just pause there for a second. Ed Payne, who is Ed Payne? Oh, well, if you scroll to the bottom of the page, Ed Payne used to work for CNN. For decades, Mr. Ed Payne was a CNN operative. So we have a CNN operative paid by Facebook and Google and an entity in direct partnership with the Chinese Communist Party, the same entity that persecutes Christians in China. Wow, wow. And we thought Pfizer was corrupt here. This is what Mr. CNN Ed Payne says. He says, quote, Does a Pfizer document list thousands of side effects from its COVID-19 vaccine? No, that's not true. The nine pages of potential side effects are part of a government-required adverse event report prepared by the pharmaceutical company. It's not meant to be a list of the expected side effects from the shot, but instead, quote, expert groups and regulatory authorities put together the possible side effects for safety monitoring purposes. Okay, Mr. Payne. So what you're saying is... um, 
it's a side effect profile, that these are potential side effects. You, you understand the parsing? The parsing that these people do to try to deny reality is something. So he is insinuating that by saying this is a document that contains a list of the side effects of this vaccine, that I was somehow insinuating that everybody who gets the vaccine will experience every one of these side effects. Now, that would be an idiotic thing to say. I would never say something like that, nor would any normal person infer that from what I was saying. But he slapped a fact check on my post because he said that these are potential side effects that could happen. They're not expected side effects. Dude, you're a loser. You're so scared of reality. You're so scared of your own profit, your own ideology being destroyed by facts and by the truth that you are actually making stuff up. And stuff is not the word that I want to use there. It's just the nice version of the word that I want to use there. These people are such insane losers, but they have so much power. They have so much power because they're in partnership with big tech and big tech has both ideological and profit-driven reasons why they are tied to big pharma, the Democratic Party, and yes, the Chinese Communist Party. So even when Fauci disappears, they have an apparatus built to try to keep the truth down. My friends, be skeptical. Be very, very skeptical. On Twitter yesterday, there were celebrities like Mark Hamill who were tweeting what can only be described as somewhat humorous, although not intended to be, and embarrassing. Before you skip the ads, I want to show you something. I want to show you these two products from Genuzel. Gentlemen, we kn you know that your wives use your razor when you're not looking. I do this to my husband, especially when we travel. Likewise, we ladies know that our husbands use our skincare products when we are not looking. So let me introduce you to Genucel. These are the two products that you should know about from Genucel. This one is called Immediate Effects 2. Immediate Effects 2. You put it under your eyes. And this is an anti-wrinkle treatment comes in a nice handy, fits in your travel carry-on um, bag. Because, these are important to you because bags and puffiness under the eyes are a problem for millions of Americans, both men and women, until now. The new Genucel Serum with plant stem cell technology works for under eye bags and puffiness. Users all across the country notice puffiness around the eyes, gone. Crow's feet, small lines, disappearing and not coming back. With Genucel's instant effects, you will see results in the first 12 hours or your money back. I guarantee it. If you order now, you can save big on Genucel's risk-free introductory offer. Just go to genucel.com slash Liz, genucel.com slash L-I-Z. Order now and use my special promo code Liz to save a 10% extra off your order today, genucel.com slash Liz. So celebrities like Mark Hamill tweeted, I actually laughed when I saw this tweet because it's just so embarrassing for him and for the Democratic Party and the mainstream media. He just tweeted, I didn't count the number, but it looks to be over 20 times, 20 or 30 times. He just said, gay, 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 gay. And the reason that someone would tweet something <laughs> as, well, funny, but stupid as this tweet is because they're buying into this idea that the Florida bill, the anti-groomer bill that we've been talking so much about, actually does prohibit somebody from saying gay, which is just wildly false. It's, it's obviously untrue. But the mainstream media and the left have done such a good job of lying that it's caused Hollywood celebrities to make absolute fools of, them, of themselves. This has never been true. But when you elicit a response like this from the mainstream media and from the left, you know you're doing something right. Um, in fact, Idaho has a similar bill to the Florida bill, except the Idaho bill is, well, it depends on who you are, better or worse. In my opinion, it's a better, it's an even better bill. This bill in Idaho makes it a felony to facilitate gender mutilation surgery on minors for the purposes of a so-called gender transition. And the reason that I talk about this today, after we talked so much about Florida yesterday, is because... We have to be skeptical of what we're told by the mainstream media. There are celebrities, there are politicians, there are media op operatives who are pretending that the Idaho bill is something that it's not. So let me tell you what the Idaho bill does. You can, I'll post a link to the legislator, to the actual piece of legislation itself on my locals, lizwheelershow.com slash locals, and you can see it for yourself, but it does make it a felony to facilitate in any way the hormone therapy or transgender surgery on children under the age of 18. As it should, this is child abuse. Of course we should. Imagine if a parent took a child to the doctor and said, listen, my child has a mental health issue and I want you to amputate her entire arm. And a doctor did that. 
The doctor should obviously be thrown in jail and so should the parents because that's child abuse. That's the exact same thing. When a 12 year old girl undergoes a double mastectomy because she thinks that she's a boy trapped in a girl's body. When a little boy is chemically castrated by his parents at age eight because he wants to wear nail polish and a dress because his mother has been grooming him to do so, then yes, the doctor that facilitates the prescription of that drug or the doctor who participates in the surgical removal of a healthy body part, of course they should be thrown in jail. This is a felony. And then the Idaho bill does a second thing. They say, if you try to bypass this bill, if you take your child out of state for this surgery, if you take your child out of state for the purpose of bypassing this bill to get hormone therapy or gender mutilation surgery for your child, then it's still a felony and you will still be charged. And this bill is fantastic. Every Republican legislature in the entire country should copy these two bills. We should be banning the abuse of our children. The, this, is, this is physical, chemical, surgical abuse of our children and be very skeptical about what you hear from the left, from the mainstream media and on social media. Be very skeptical because the Idaho bill is actually a good thing. The other aspect of skepticism that I have to offer you today is an article that was posted on The Federalist. And this article is titled, NATO Intervention in Ukraine Could Spark a Nuclear War. Here's how it could happen. And this article is, has made me think so much about what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. And it has caused me to be cautious of Zelensky. And when I say cautious of Zelensky, there, let me caveat this by saying there's no doubt that Zelensky... Is, is acting with courage. There's no doubt that Zelensky is acting in the interest of his own nation. There's no doubt that Russia didn't anticipate the amount of resistance that they've faced from the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government. All of this is a good thing. However, the Ukrainian national interest is not in perfect alignment with the United States national interest. And this article paints a fascinating view of why. So I wanna read through this. So now that we can get out, we can travel, we can take vacations. We want to celebrate some of our favorite times and we should do so by turning our new memories into art. So when I first heard about paintyourlife.com, I thought this is a fabulous idea. Turning a picture into a painting that's been painted by a professional artist is like a whole new level. I love this so much. When I first heard about it, I also figured it might be expensive. Not so for the quality of the work. It's actually incredibly affordable. So if you want to give a truly meaningful gift, you've got to try paintyourlife.com. Like I said, you can use any picture, yourself, your kids, family, a special place, someone you loved who isn't around anymore, a cherished pet, even an action shot of you or your children playing your favorite sport. It's super fast too. You can receive your portrait in as little as two weeks. At paintyourlife.com, there's no risk. If you don't love the final painting, your money is refunded, guaranteed. And right now, as a limited time offer, you can get 20% off your painting. That's right, 20% off and free shipping. To get the special offer, text the word Liz to 64,000. That's L-I-Z to 64,000. Paintyourlife.com helps you celebrate the moments that matter to you the most. Disclaimer here, message and data rates may apply. Terms also apply. Available at paintyourlife.com slash terms. Again, text L-I-Z to 64,000. Okay, so let's read this article together. Um, it's written by a man named Harry Kazanias. And he says, in the simulation that we mapped out, not only does NATO get sucked in unintentionally, but Russia releases nuclear weapons in its desperation. He said, how did we just kill a billion people? Over just three days, as I have done countless times over the last several years, a group of past and present senior U.S. government officials from both sides of the aisle gathered to wage a NATO-Russia war in a simulation at the end of 2019. In the course of what we called the NATO-Russia War of 2019, well, clever name, we estimated 1 billion people died. And if we aren't careful, what happened in a simulation could happen if a NATO-Russia war erupts in Ukraine. In fact, he says, in the simulation I mentioned above from 2019, in which Russia invades Ukraine in a similar way as it did over the last week or so, not only does NATO get sucked in unintentionally, but Russia eventually releases nuclear weapons in its desperation. The result is an eventual escalation of bigger and more dangerous nuclear weapons, whereby over 1 billion lives are lost. He says, but before we start staring into the abyss, allow me to explain the goal of such simulations. NATO clearly would have a massive conventional advantage in any war with Moscow, ensuring that in a straight up fight, Putin would lose. However, Russia has stated time and time again, it will use nuclear weapons to defend its territory and its regime if it feels mortally threatened. Our simulation always seems to ask, can we ever defeat Russian President Vladimir Putin in an armed conflict over Ukraine or the Baltics and not start a nuclear war in the process? So far, over the last several years, and with at least 100 different participants that all held different ideas 
about war and political allegiances, the answer is a flat out no. So again, the reason that I want to, that I found this article so interesting, I've, this has been in my head for the last two or three days, just thinking, pondering over and over because it does change my view of what Zelensky is doing. Meaning Zelensky is rallying the world, right? He is engaging in a propaganda war, which is propaganda. You know, the Snake Island story was propaganda. The Ukrainian beauty queen who was fighting, that was propaganda. That wasn't happening. The, the ghost of Kiev, that wasn't happening. Now, I don't think propaganda in this sense is immoral in the context of a war. It's, it's, it's a war tactic. But what Zelensky is doing, understand the purpose of this propaganda. What Zelensky is doing is trying to rally the world to support him. So hold that thought for a minute because rallying the world to support him is how the West is reacting, but there might be graver consequences. Here's what the article says. The scenario the group decided to test back in late 2019 was similar to today. Russia decided to invade Ukraine under the excuse that it must defend Russian-speaking peoples that are being oppressed by Ukraine's fascist government. Sounds familiar, right? In our scenario, we assumed Russia performs far more admirably than it does today, but has more limited objectives in that Moscow wants to connect Crimea to separatist regions in eastern Ukraine that are under its effective control. We assume that Russia does that quickly, achieving most of its military objectives in roughly four days. But Ukraine does not give up so easily, just like in real life today. Ukrainian forces, after taking heavy losses, mount an impressive counterattack whereby Russia loses over 100 tanks and over 2,500 soldiers. Images on social media show Russian armor ablaze, fighter jets shot down from the skies, and arms are now flowing in from the West in massive numbers. Putin is outraged, he writes. He thought Ukraine would simply roll over, but he does not factor into his calculus the nearly decades-long training Kyiv received from the U.S. and NATO, nor Ukraine's military buildup for the past several years that was focused on this scenario. Russia then decides that its limited military objectives were a mistake and that all of Ukraine must be demilitarized. Moscow then launches a massive ballistic and cruise missile strike followed up by Russia's air force launching its own shock and awe campaign, destroying a vast majority of Ukraine's command and control structure, its air force, air defense, and armored units in the process. Again, it's all too familiar, right? Just wait. At the same time, Russia starts surging troops to the borders of Ukraine in what looks like an imminent general invasion and occupation of the entire country. Here's things... Here is where things take a turn for the worse. A Russian ballistic missile's guidance system fails and crash lands into NATO member Poland, killing 34 civilians as it tragically lands into a populated village along the Polish-Ukraine border. While the missile was not directed at Poland intentionally, pictures on social media show children crying for their mothers and bodies left unrecognizable, and demands for justice and revenge mount. To its credit, Poland, which has its own tortured history with the Soviet Union and Russia, does its best to show restraint. While not responding with its own military, it leads an effort to see that Moscow pays a steep price for its aggression in Ukraine and actions, even unintentional, in Poland. Warsaw leads a diplomatic and economic boycott of Moscow, resulting in Russia being kicked out of SWIFT, again, sound familiar, as well as direct sanctions on Russian banks, similar to what we're seeing today. In our scenario, Russia's reaction is also swift. Moscow decides to launch a massive cyber attack on Poland, having based cyber warriors all throughout NATO territory. They take Poland's entire electrical grid down, banking sector, energy plants, and more, taking Poland back to the Stone Age. And this, he writes, is where the nightmare begins. Even though attribution is hard to achieve, Poland appeals to NATO and starts to privately share its desire to invoke Article 5 of the NATO Charter, declaring that an attack on one is an attack on the entire alliance. NATO is worried as there is debate on how far to punish Russia, while also feeling as if they do not have a clear military objective amongst the member states, as some want to respond to what happened in Poland, while others feel they must intervene militarily in Ukraine. He writes, here's where NATO surprises everyone. The alliance decides to set up a limited no-fly zone around the Ukrainian city of Lviv to protect innocent civilians and refugees that are trapped and have nowhere to go. Russia is warned, warned NATO's not intervening in the conflict, but will ensure that its planes and airspace are protected. NATO does not or does make clear the jets in the sky will be in skies above Ukraine, but will not operate from Ukrainian territory. In Moscow, Putin now gets a sense that NATO is destined to intervene on Ukraine's side. Russia fears NATO will use this protected corridor as a base of operations. Before NATO can impose its no-fly zone, Putin orders strikes in any remaining airfields and military access assets around Lviv. Here's where Putin miscalculates and sets the stage for a NATO-Russia war. He issues another cyber attack on military infrastructure. This is the last straw for NATO, which then decides direct intervention in Ukraine is necessary. This, of course triggers Putin using nuclear weapons. So when I read this, I thought this paints Zelensky 
and Zelensky's actions in an entirely different light than I had seen them before. Now, I'm fundamentally skeptical of a president that's presiding over a country as corrupt as Ukraine to begin with. I was never one of those people that would turn immediately into a Zelensky fanboy. You can respect someone's actions in a certain situation without making them an idol or putting them on a pedestal. And that's how I viewed Zelensky. I thought, okay, he's being courageous. That's great. I, I respect that. But am I going to idolize him and make him into this, this figure that is revered? Not yet. Because Why? Because I'm skeptical. I'm a very skeptical person. But this article and these war games that have been run over a hundred times in the last decade with this exact scenario of Russia wanting to take over Ukraine um, have resulted in the same thing. They've resulted in a nuclear war every time. And so it made me look at Zelensky agitating around the world and see that even that, the word change that I use, before I was saying, okay, Zelensky is trying to rally the world to support. Now I think he's agitating the world or I think he could be agitating the world because what is he trying to do? He's trying through propaganda and his own personality and displays of courage, yes, He's trying to change public opinion about the idea of the U.S. or NATO being physically involved in the conflict in Ukraine. Previously, the American people were like, no, 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 no. We do not want to get involved. We do not want to send U.S. troops. We do not want to fight Russia. We do not want war, another war. Absolutely not. But what Zelensky has done is he's rallied the world. He's rallied people. He's actually changed. He's been successful in changing public opinion about how much the U.S. and NATO should be involved in this conflict in Ukraine. And remember, when public opinion changes, that means when our minds are effectively changed, that impacts the decisions of our politicians. So there are politicians in our government right now who are advocating for this no-fly zone, who are advocating for NATO to be more involved than they are right now. And I thought, well, this is this is a dangerous line that we're playing with because the more willing our politicians are to give more or to scooch closer to being directly involved with Ukraine, the closer we are also scooching to nuclear war or possible nuclear war with Russia, right? So all, all, all this being said, I still think that we should give military aid to the Ukraine, but we have to be very careful that we are not, as the American people, falling for, falling for Zelensky's propaganda as it, as it applies to us, right? If the propaganda were supposed to apply to Russia, fine, I don't care. But don't fall for propaganda in the sense that it's not just a story that turns out not to be true. It's designed to play on your emotions and it's designed to change your opinion, your opinion being important in our politicians' decisions and our politicians' decisions about how to get involved, whether that's verbally, whether that's physically, whether that's financially, whether that's militarily, will make a difference in whether Putin feels trapped, whether he can offer an off-ramp to Ukraine and take an off-ramp himself and defuse this situation, or whether it escalates into something more serious, a war between the U.S. and Russia or NATO and Russia, or God forbid, some kind of nuclear strike. Again, I'll post the link to this article and you can read it in full. I'll post this on the Liz Wheeler Show community on Locals, lizwheelershow.com slash locals. Read it. Let me know what you think. I thought this was fascinating. I also, by the way, had a very interesting conversation with Senator Ted Cruz this week. I asked him, about given the fact that he has access to both unclassified, uh, which is open source information, but also classified information about Vladimir Putin, I asked him whether Vladimir Putin was still a rational actor, because you can be a nutcase and a murderer and a dictator and still be a rational actor as it pertains to foreign policy, or you can be an irrational actor. And Putin has, up until now, been known to be a rational actor. Condoleezza Rice last week said she's met Putin a half dozen times. He was always a rational actor. But lately, she said he looks to be acting more erratic. She insinuated that he's acting irrationally. And I asked Senator Cruz what, what he thought. Given his access to information that I don't have, is Putin still a rational actor or irrational actor? This, this conversation that I had with the senator um, is not public yet. It will be released sometime this week. Um, this is what he said. Take a listen. I can tell you there are lots of discussions, both in public and in classified settings, about what his mental state is. And I think it is clear he has gotten more erratic. He's gotten older. He's, I think, 70 years old now. And as he gets older, I, I think he dreams of, of restoring the days of Russian glory. You know, we talked on the podcast a couple of weeks ago about this megalomaniacal speech he gave that, that, that was bone-chilling, 
about going back not just to, to the Soviet Union, but going back to the Russian Empire of 1922. You know, he argued that that Stalin was too soft and too lenient, which is scary as hell. Anyone that looks at Stalin and says, okay, that guy's squishy, th that ought to worry you. Um, you know, I have heard some speculation that his mortality is is starting to haunt him, that, that he's worried he won't have time to recreate the Russian Empire. Um, I have not seen any evidence in the public record of anything like diminished mental capacity, sadly, like we've seen in Joe Biden. I've not seen any evidence of that. Uh, but there's no doubt that he is, my assessment of him is that he's grandiose in, in his vision and he's encouraged by the weakness of Biden. So I don't think he's nuts. I actually think Putin is behaving as a rational actor. When you have Biden who's so weak um, that he's waiving sanctions on Russia and Putin, he basically invited Putin to invade. And I've been saying for a year that I thought Putin was gonna invade Ukraine. It, 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 I don't think that's a, a failure to think rationally. I think that's actually responding rationally to the weakness from the American president. I do think that this is a question that needs to be answered by the United States government because whether or not Putin is a rational actor, whether his actions can essentially be predicted based on an understanding of his interests and his ideology, or whether his actions cannot be predicted because he's being erratic, that makes a huge difference in how the United States should be responding. So the full clip, the full conversation that I had with Senator Ted Cruz about this topic can be found on verdictwithtedcruz.com slash plus. If you use the promo code cloakroom, you can get your first month free on your annual subscription. That's verdictwithtedcruz.com slash plus. Also, I want to give a shout out to uh, the Locals VIP on the Liz Wheeler Show community on Locals. It is Smendy, smendy 86 Welcome to the Liz Wheeler Show community. We are delighted to have you. We have gotten so many new members and supporters and VIPs on the Liz Wheeler Show community. It is, it, it's been an absolute delight. I don't think that I have ever seen more interaction or I've ever engaged in more discussion with you guys than our, our live stream during the State of the Union. So many new usernames, new um, people who had just joined taking part in the discussion and it was a delight to see you. smendy 86 you are our VIP of the week. Welcome. On that note, thank you for watching today. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. The Liz Wheeler Show is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Chad Abbott. Director of photography, Kevin McRoberts. Editor, Alejandro Figuerilla. Sound mixer, Robin Fenderson. Director of marketing, Emily Washler. Production and talent coordinator, Matt Toffler. And senior publicist, Patricia Jackson. This has been a Soundfront production. If you haven't already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.